Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's live series show, the Freedom Series with Mike McCallowitz. Uh, Mike's an author of Prof First, Clockwork, Surge, and The Pumpkin Plan, and his newest book, Fix This Next. Uh, by Mike's 31st birthday, he had founded and uh, sold two companies, one to a private equity, another to a Fortune 500. Uh, today, he's running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Good morning, Mike. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Barry. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so grateful to have you here. And uh, welcome to everyone who's watching us live, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so grateful to have you here as well. Uh, two, three things, please. Number one, just click the like button. Let us know that you are watching. Uh, number two, let's make this as interactive as possible. So the more that you guys can uh, ask questions in the comments, uh, Rafi from my team is scrolling the interwebs, uh, bringing all your, your comments into us here so we can get them answered. And number three, uh, start a watch party. Mike's got a phenomenal amount of experience. I know last time we chatted, I walked away with a bunch of notes myself. Uh, you've obviously helped thousands, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs worldwide throughout your books as well. So uh, please start a watch party. Let more people know about what we're doing here. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited uh, for this. Yeah. Uh, particularly with, with what's going on with this COVID crisis and the pandemic, which is clearly not going to go away for quite a period. I'm happy we're still, you know, with, with technology and so forth, still able to communicate and share best practices for the, the, this isn't the great recession, this is the great reinvention. You know, there's a new need for business. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that, um, I think there's never been a better time than right now in the world for entrepreneurs to kind of rise forwards to uh, really start to allow their uniqueness to, to, to move out. And why I say that is because I think for a long time, people maybe dealt with crappy jobs or uh, you know, they're employed and uh, I guess experiencing some sense of false security that they have this solid job. Yet the last six months have kind of proven that a lot of people maybe haven't been happy. Uh, they can't rely on the certainty of their jobs anymore that is kind of causing more people. I think online business is one of the biggest search terms uh, on the web right now. I think so many business owners, uh, I think a portion I should say of business owners have a, a vision and they say, I'm going to go for it. And they get to the cliff and they just jump. I think another portion of business owners have a vision, a plan for it. They get to the cliff and say, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a big leap. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I need to plan some more. And they walk back and they say, okay, this is the time. They get to the cliff and they're like, that's still a big leap. Yeah. And we just need that push. And um, it, it's, it's scary when you get pushed. But at least in the U.S. alone, we saw um, at the height of unemployment, 40 million people uh, lose their jobs overnight, not because they deserved it, not because they didn't have capability, just because someone else there said, it's you who's going, not me. And now there's 40 million people that got pushed and a portion of them had entrepreneurial aspirations. I think in retrospect, it's gonna be the greatest gift they were given. It may not feel that way right now because you know entrepreneurship is jumping off the cliff and building the plane as you're going down, right? Yeah. So it's scary in the early stages, I am very confident a good portion of them are to get lift and be successful and be grateful for this shift. Yeah. Hard to see it now, but I'm, I'm sure that's what the future will hold. I, I kind of, uh, it's a great perspective. I kind of feel that's, that's adversity in general is that often uh, we fight or resist the challenge and adversities that life throw up to us. But I'm not sure about you. Like if I look back on my life, it's not those days that it's like, this is the best day of my life, those ones that I can remember. It's the right. ones where I was down and out on my knees, crying, like praying to God for help that I can remember because th those, those moments that I think have defined me and made me who I am today. It's, it's funny. And you were so kind in the bio. You're like, oh, he's, he built and sold multi-million dollar companies. It's true. The one thing that I leave out of my CV, so I didn't give you the chance to read it, is a, a big collapse I had. I built and sold a couple companies. Um, and have made myself a self-made millionaire in my early 30s, and I thought I was hot shit. I thought I knew everything. I didn't. I thought I did. And so I started another business as an angel investor, and, and I sucked at it. I, I didn't understand what angel investing was. I thought it was a cool title. I, I was putting good money after bad. I started all these different businesses in disparate areas. They didn't complement. I didn't yeah. understand the importance of that. And within six months, all of them except for one were out of business. I was paying bills for businesses that didn't exist. The last one, it was a slow decline. And I lost, it only took me two years, I lost every penny I'd made in building those first two companies. Yeah. I came home to my family, I'll never forget, I was on Valentine's Day, I actually write about one of my books and, and I had to tell my family we were gonna lose our house, which we lost, our cars, our like all the stuff was going yeah. away. 
And I told my daughter this, she was nine years old at the time that I, I can't afford to send her to horseback riding lessons. As she heard this, she, I was crying and sobbing and, and, yeah. and the whole family was just stunned because I'd been lying to them by omission. I hadn't told them how bad things were getting. She ran to her bedroom. I thought she was running away, but she ran to her bedroom to grab her piggy bag. And she came back and she's like, daddy, daddy. She goes, I can provide for us. I know you can't anymore. And that was like, I feel emotional again right now. I was so ashamed of myself. Mm. So proud of her. That moment, I would argue, was perhaps my dark, one of my darkest moments in my life. And um, I think when I leave our planet, on my final breath, I'm going to reflect on that moment. It became a turning moment for me in this realization that I had to relearn what entrepreneurship was. It isn't pump and dump. It mm. isn't, you know, build something for someone else to buy. It is, you know, profit's a habit, as an example. I, I got to bake it into every transaction. I need to bring about efficiency. Uh, hustle and grind is not entrepreneurship by any stretch of imagination. It's about building an organization for other people to do the work. It, you know, and the realization is this, that 7% uh, of the world population is entrepreneurs. You, myself, the folks listening in. 93% of the world population is looking for a job. We're wow. job providers. So here in the US, there's 40 million people that lost jobs, 7% are ready to get, they're, they get pushed off the cliff and they're ready to start flying. 93% need jobs again. Well, it's our job to provide jobs. I didn't realize that. I, I was actually doing the work myself. I was stealing jobs because I was trying to keep it all to me. Yeah. So I really had to reinvestigate what, I, what entrepreneurship was. And, and to your point, I thought that was the darkest moment in my life. And, and it was, but it was the most enlightening. You know, when you're in the valley, you can see the mountaintop. And that, that's when I woke into, I, I've, actually I'll show you on my wall. I have a life's purpose is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. Yeah. So I have it right there. And that's my life's mission. Every day I'm at work, I'm like, I gotta fix this. I'm not gonna let any entrepreneur struggle. If I have anything to do with it, I'm gonna support entrepreneurs and not let entrepreneurs struggle. And yes. so it gave me that clarity. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny, as, as, as I was hearing you share that, it reminded me, um, I was sitting in a cafe in Bali a few months back when I was writing um, a, a chapter of my book. And uh, someone said to me, don't you feel guilty that like you're here drinking coconut, you know, sipping coconuts, writing your book, surfing while your team's at home working? And I said, not at all. Like I, I would have a few years back, I would have felt guilty because that was where I was at. Yeah. But what I realized over the last few years is that people love doing things differently to what I do. Like there's things, there's things that I hate doing and my team members love doing. And I, I never used to know that because I used to just, I guess, project my own beliefs back into my business at the back of the world. It's like, oh, well, I didn't enjoy managing people, so why the hell would someone else do that for me? But when you can look into your organization and see that, that, that your staff, your team absolutely love their jobs, and because of you loving your aspect, being the entrepreneur, being the visionary, creating the ideas, innovating, like that's your part to play in the business. It doesn't mean you have to be the one that's behind a computer sending invoices out every day. Someone else could do that that enjoys doing that. It's just finding the right people to do it for you. And, you, and, you, and I'd argue you shouldn't be the one doing that. Like it's your mission not to do it. I, I traveled a lot pre-COVID and it's just now starting up again, you know, flying around. And admittedly, I stopped by McDonald's pretty often. <laughs> and um, I started doing this thing about a year ago. When I go to McDonald's to get whatever, I would go to the cashier and say, hey, uh, may I speak with the owner? Not one instance, I probably did this 50 times, not one instance was the owner ever there. The, the owner wasn't flipping the burgers or cooking the fries and it wasn't in that glorified closet they call the office managers or the store manager's uh, office. That was someone else. In one instance, the cashier said to me, she goes, oh, the owner. She's like, I never met the owner. And then she said, oh yeah, he came in uh, a couple of months ago to pick up the money. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I, it was like, oh my gosh. But that's what the owner's job is. I, I, I own stock in, uh, in Ford, and this is not a stock tip. I just own stock in Ford. Every quarter, Ford sends a stock distribution money to me. I don't look at it and say, oh my gosh, I, I need to go down to the factory now and work for this or, or, uh, <laughs> or return the money. What I say is I invested in Ford. I, I took risk in, I'm hoping that the Ford company continues to thrive so I make money, but it may fail. That's the risk I'm taking on. Yeah. When we start a business, we take on way more risk than buying a few shares of Ford. We take all the risk. Yeah. So our intention of taking on that risk is the company flourishes and that yeah. survives. And the return for that is financial freedom. The company says, thank you. 
Thank you for creating jobs. Thank you for starting me. Thank you for providing for clients. And our job is to collect the money. That's yeah. not sinful. That's actually the intention. I think the ultimate sin is when we do the work. If I'm yeah. doing the invoicing, I'm preventing someone else from having a job doing invoicing. Love that. When I'm doing any of the work here, I'm preventing someone else from doing their work. Now, yeah. one little caveat as a small business owner, I do like to work myself. Yeah. And I've given myself the freedom to still do work. I love, like what we're doing now, I consider being the spokesperson. I love it. I love yeah. to share ideas. I love to learn ideas. I love to write books. That's what I am. But I sure as heck don't steal the jobs from other people for the operations of our business. My job is to give them those jobs. Yeah, absolutely love that. Uh, if you're joining us live, welcome. Please hit the like button. Uh, also, put your questions below. Be sure to get them answered today as well. And start a watch party. I think more entrepreneurs need to hear this message because a lot of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are walking around with shitty beliefs. Their beliefs, is, I think about it, Mike, like we, we grow up and we go through school and we're taught uh, through our early stage of employment that more work equals more money. Do more hours, get paid more money. Put in extra work, get paid more money. And then we become an entrepreneur and we have this mentality built into us that it's like more work equals more money. And this is why so many business owners get stuck. They get so stuck in the business because they're, they're running these, these false beliefs that were created to get them to a certain place in life, but not going to see them thrive in business themselves. So the, the, I would say, sadly, for most entrepreneurs, the greatest day for that business owner is the day before they start their business. Because that's, that's the last day of the dream. It's like, you know, I'm going to change the world. This idea is going to make, I'm going to achieve financial freedom, personal freedom, everything I wanted. I can be of such great service. This is the day, tomorrow morning. Then we get in there. It's like, where's, where's the clients? Where's the money? <laughs> oh my God. It's a, this is a shit storm, right? Yeah. So now the only way to get through that is through hustle and grind. Yeah. And I do believe in their early stage, you need to do the work. We don't have the other resources available. We don't have the, the, the money um, or the access to, to the, the technology, all those things to get the business going. So in the very beginning, the seed yeah. has to be you. The problem is it becomes a trap because first of our education is work harder, make more. The second thing is we affirm that education by working harder and over time starting to make more. Like, wow, I'm really, I'm working my ass off in this business and uh, year number two, I made more than year number one. Year three, I made more. Clearly I need to work harder. And that's when this becomes workaholism. It's like just work and work and work. But we, we, at a certain point, we tap ourselves out. Like I, I'm working so hard, it's not making more money, I'm exhausted and we try to push through it and we don't do it. Yeah. As early on as possible, we need to start extracting ourselves from the business. I believe the number one job for an entrepreneur who works in the business is to get the freak out of the business. Yeah. Pull ourselves out. And the only way to do that is by hiring. And uh, the mistake though, I think some small businesses make is if it's just me, I got to hire that first employee. I can't afford them. And what we're thinking is a full-time employee. Do you realize this. If you're a one person shop and you hire one person, that's a hundred percent growth. Yeah. That's like Google who has a hundred thousand employees making an announcement today in the news saying, we're going to go a hundred percent tomorrow morning. We're adding a hundred thousand new employees <laughs> tomorrow morning. Like Google couldn't do that. And yeah. if Google, but why the freak do you think you can do it? You can't. Yeah. So the key is fractional hires. When we're starting to build, don't hire that first full-time employee. Hire someone to work one hour a week just to take one task off of you to give you some relief. Then bring someone to bring on, you know, 10 hours a week. Bring on another part-time employee and you start structuring it that way. You start peeling the stuff away from you. That's how you start removing yourself from doing the work. I, I absolutely love that perspective. Like I've never seen it that way before. It's like that first hire is equivalent of Google, like hundred percent growth. So that, <laughs> right. That's incredible. The process that I talk about um, in my book called the task audit. And it's just that it's going through and auditing your time, working at how much time it's taking to do each thing, so smart. The, the, the frequency in doing it and then working out over a docs period. Do I delegate it to someone inside my organization? Do I outsource it to someone outside my organization? Do I continue doing it because I have to as a business owner, it's my responsibility. Or do I stop doing it because it's simply not moving me towards my end goal of the company? And that's a way we found, like I, I went through that process myself every single week until I was operationally free from my business. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so smart. So I find that entrepreneurs are, well, all of humans are really bad at guessing or assuming what's going on in their business yes. because we trust our gut instinct. And 
our gut is wonderful for personal survival. Like if you're walking down a dark alley and you're like, something's not right here, please do turn around. You are about to get murdered, get out of there. Because you know, our senses are triggering that sight, smell, hearing. But in our business, we are not neurologically wired into our business. Our eyes aren't connected to our business, our hearing isn't, our smell. Yet we think that our gut instinct is nailing it. We're like, you know, I, I, kinda, I gotta change this, I gotta, I gotta do that. But when we actually look at the data, when there's data significance, then we can validate our opinions or, or not validate them. We can find that there's another truth. So auditing ourselves and our business, track, track our time is so critical. Hmm. You, know, you, you ask someone, and when I say someone, I'm talking about myself, well, how much time you spend on uh, Facebook, Mike? I'm like, oh, you know, half hour a day. When you do the analytics, it's like, oh, it's actually about four hours a day, not a half hour. <laughs> I, you know, I must've been rounding. And uh, that data gives, gives undeniable clarity. So yeah. we do have to do those audits. That's so smart, so yeah. smart. And this is where, like you spoke about that and Fix This Next as well around the intuition versus having that, that understanding, like data doesn't lie and Fix This Next is a fantastic tool because as you speak about, like one of the biggest challenges most entrepreneurs have is they don't know what the biggest challenge is. And the Fix This Next methodology is such a fantastic methodology to help to gain clarity, not just now, but now, next week, next month, next year, of what's broken or where the gaps are, what we'd be focusing on. Because often, like if we look at from this, uh, let's look at a client journey perspective. 99% of business owners I speak to, uh, it's like, what's your biggest issue around growth? Are oh, more leads. It's actually not. It's the conversion yeah. rate sucks. Their average, average sales not there. They're not retaining clients very long or they're not profitable. Yet yeah. people go and throw money into you know, generating more leads when often that's not the thing they need to be focusing on. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or they're ridiculously inefficient. You know, it's funny, I, I was with the manufacturer, like we don't have enough business coming in. I'm like, you actually can't handle the business that's coming in. Uh, you're, you're so inefficient. You're losing money on every transaction. If we had half the volume, uh, we can get this place organized. I mean, you know, but, but we rely on our gut instinct. Yeah. We're not wired into our business. Most business owners, that therefore, since we're not wired into our business and we try to rely on instinct, we go into that firefighter mode. Mm. What happens is whatever the most prevalent issue is, I call it the apparent issue that presents itself, gets prioritized. So there's thousands of different things that are constantly going on in the business. Whatever is immediately put in front of us, the apparent issue is the one we tackle. Yeah. They, they say, you know, urgent, we, we focus on the urgent. We don't focus on the urgent because we don't even know what the urgent is. We simply know the next one that's in front of us and say, that's the priority. So we jump on the apparent issue and start addressing it. Then if we address it, there's a dopamine release. So when something's completed, if I can dis, you know, respond to that quick email, um, if I could squelch that, that dis disappointed client, if I can address that client, that employee's question, every time I complete a task, I get a dopamine hit, that kind of internal drug. And I'm like, oh, whew, got something done today. So that keeps that firefighter mode going is we're constantly hitting a parent, a parent. But we're not considering the impactful because we have no clue what it is. Yeah. So when I wrote Fix This Next, I based upon Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I translated into a business hierarchy of needs. There is a needs structure that is consistent across all business. It's the DNA of business, if you will, that needs to be satisfied in a certain order in order for the business to healthily grow. And many of us, since we don't know what the hierarchy is, we revert to what our gut says, like, oh, we need more sales, we need those leads, ramp up the leads. And, and then when the business isn't uh, progressing, or is there even, some businesses experience this, you can see increasing sales, decreasing profitability with increasing sales. The business says, ah, clearly we need more sales because our, the profit's decreasing, sell our way out of it. And yeah. um, we're trying to base it upon this firefighter mode, this gut instinct. What we need to do is, is take a, a pregnant pause, a step back and simply evaluate the true heart of needs and pinpoint the impactful thing. Yeah. Ignore the apparent, identify the impactful, resolve that. And the challenge of course is now the dopamine. So when we're fixing this issue after issue, while in the long term it's exhausting, in the short term, dopamine. Now we're gonna flip it, we're gonna do kind of these longer term projects, we still have to spin the plates. You've got to keep the business yeah. you know, behind the scenes still operating, but we have to tackle the big important projects. It's a delayed gratification. That dopamine hit is going to take maybe now two weeks or two months. That is a very conscious consideration. We got to say, listen, I got to stick this out because this is delayed gratification. But when I hit this, the business is going to take a permanent move forward, a permanent leap forward. And then when I start repeating that, the whole game shifts. I know from practical experience, 
I spent the first 15 plus years of my entrepreneurial life as a workaholic, firefighter, it is exhausting. I spent the, the last 10 years as someone that's just building systems and having a business that can run itself. It is a long-term play, but the gratification at the end of it is tremendous. When, when I go on vacation, I come back and there's more money waiting for me and a, a business has grown waiting for me. I, I came in, I just returned from a vacation. I, the, a new employee met me uh, remotely because of COVID, but her name is Marixa and Marixa uh, joined us and uh, she goes, hey, uh, glad to meet you. I said, well, welcome to our company. I heard you just came on board. She goes, yeah. She goes, hey, what, what's your job? What, what do you do here? Who do you work for? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm the owner guy. Oh, yeah. So it's so funny like, like, to bring an employee on that had more understanding of our infrastructure and the people that were here than me. Um, in the past, that was a big ego punch. Now it's like, oh my gosh, this company okay. has, has breath. It doesn't need me, which also gives me the right now to have the joy I get out of the business, doing what we're doing, writing books, being the spokesperson. No longer is the business dependent on me. Yeah. I, I had my first moment of that last year was a client. Like one of my clients reached out to my team and they're like, who's this Barry guy that's sending me Oh, emails? yeah, so awesome. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. bunch, yeah, I've got a bunch of questions here. If you guys are watching live, uh, welcome. So grateful to have you here. Please uh, put your questions below in the comment, wherever you're watching from, and we'll get them answered for sure. Uh, first question, Mark, do you believe as a business grows, uh, it should be making more money and you should be putting in less time? Yeah, yeah, the general rule of thumb is yes, with some kind of asterisks and notes. The question is more money. Um, is, is that what you so desire? I believe that um, more money isn't necessarily better. I believe knowing the lifestyle you want to support and having the business support that is the definition of financial freedom. Mm. So um, for some people, uh, a, a business doesn't need to grow and, and more money isn't necessary because they're living the lifestyle they desire. It's okay to say, this is the right size business for me. Mm. I used to believe that a bigger business is a better business. I, re I take that back. Yeah. The right size business is the right business and it will find itself. So you will find that sweet spot. I also agree, you know, with time that may not be the desire. Some people get the most joy out of doing the work. There's some people that love doing the craft craftsmen. And if that's your passion, listen, if that brings you happiness, uh, congratulations. And if you have happiness and are achieving the lifestyle standard you want, and you're getting joy in those, you found it. Uh, mm -hmm. Congratulations. I knew a guy, a personal friend, Unfortunately, well, he's that's fortunate. He's a personal friend, but he had a two hundred fifty million dollar company. That's the unfortunate part. The 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 burden and stress put on him, and then the business collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had a big business. Yeah, it wasn't a good business. I don't think it gave him joy. Yeah, I really believe our, our the basis is uh, is joy and an impact to others. So the right size business will find you. That's my answer. I feel that's shifting a lot too, Mike. Like I've been in business for over eighteen years now. And maybe it's my perspective, but I remember when I first joined, business was very different. Like there seemed to be a lot more ego in business, a lot more drive to be big and to be great. And I've noticed just the last sort of five or six years, there seems to be more of a, a flavor around business owners creating lifestyle businesses. You know, they don't have to be big and massive, but businesses that pay them enough money, that provide them the freedom and they actually enjoy working in is more important now than what it was, you know, 15, 16, 18, you know, 18 years ago. You know, I've noticed that too. I wonder if part, maybe a confirmation bias in the last five, 10 years, I suspect you've aged five or 10 years, me yeah. too. And um, I think as I get older, my own perspective is uh, bigger isn't better for me. Yeah. And so maybe I'm seeing that more, but I also see certain data that supports it. Again, it could be a confirmation bias, yeah. but the rise of things like Etsy, Etsy to me is just an extraordinary platform. It gave a marketing platform to mm. individuals that didn't have it before. So before, if you were a craftsman that made stuff, so this actually was made on Etsy. Mm. Uh, that tree was made on Etsy. Uh, my guitar there, the guitar strap was made on Etsy. I'm a big Etsy fan. All those individual craftsmen, craftspeople is probably the appropriate term nowadays. All those craftspeople did, had to also be marketers. They mm. also had to do all these other elements of a business that I don't think necessarily gave them joy. They, they love to do their craft. And I'm just making an assumption here, but they love the craft. And therefore, they love the craft, but they couldn't sell it and therefore it wasn't sustainable and it was a glorified hobby. You now see people able to express themselves the way they want and those certain other elements are handled for them. So, so they can 
they can focus on their form of expression and joy. Yeah. And I think that has been a wonderful innovation of current times. These type of middlemen, if you will, these sales platforms, and that therefore people can pursue a lifestyle business and, and it can fulfill them financially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, Greg from Melbourne, regarding hiring strategies, does Mike rely on remote workers? Uh, Greg, we partially do. So, you know, remote now is a very nebulous term with COVID. Everyone seems remote, right? So I'm remote, you're re everyone's remote. Um, so what I, I would deem remote was what we called offshore. So if it was someone who was native to, for my case, to the US and was in Australia or in the Philippines or somewhere else would be a remote worker. And what that meant to us was there was often a time barrier, sometimes a culture barrier, sometimes a language barrier. Uh, we have done work with that and it's been moderately successful uh, in what we call a dialogue type of jobs where they had to have dialogue with clients. It's been wildly successful in task jobs where it's like data entry or something like that. Um, and our local workers though, get the culture and the pulse of the business. So any of the outward facing stuff, social media, um, when it comes to communicating with clients, sales, development of new products, we in-house all that stuff. Mm. The interesting thing is I found a way to compete with offshoring um, price-wise, because if, if we outsource uh, from the US here to someone say in the Philippines, the, the cost differential, differential was very persuasive to hire someone offshore. I found how to do it here in the US, you can do it in Australia, is part-time workers. Mm -hmm. Here's the, the trick with part-time workers. We hired this woman, her name is Amy, uh, four or five years ago. She came on board, uh, she's gonna work three hours a day. I gave her eight hours of work um, for our last full-time employee that she was replacing and said, Here, here's your work. And expecting her to take the week to do it. At the end of the day, she said, hey, got this all done. Um, ready for my work schedule for tomorrow. And I'm like, um, okay, went through it. Sure enough, all done. I came to her again the next day. I said, let me give her eight hours of work. I did, got it all done that day. That's when I realized for most people, our max work efficiency during any day is about three to four hours of productivity. Mm -hmm. So an eight hour worker, we can't work eight hours straight. We need that break. We need to go on Facebook. We just need that mental break. We maybe look like we're working, but our mind is drifting. Amy, on the other hand, she does the Facebook at home. When she comes into work, she's like, I got three hours to bang things out. There's no bullshit around. She comes in, she's cranking. All the, the battery charging time is done on her time, not my dime. Yes. So extraordinary output and compressed time. Yeah. It, it's a concept called Parkinson's law. So you can kind of Google that, Greg, and look into it. But I really encourage you to look for local cultural fit, part-time work workers, and you may be surprised on their productivity. Yeah, yeah. I love that. We always use what's available to us. You have Parkinson's law, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will say too, though, we, we're kind of the other side. So we've got a team, like half our team are actually Filipino based. Um, it took us a long time to get to where we are, though. Like it was probably three or four years of trial and error mm. because of the cultural difference. Um, we decided to go virtual about five years ago. And the main reason being is that we had an office, but I was always traveling. And so the culture would be great while I was there and I'd leave and I'd come back and the culture would be shitty. And it'd take a week to pepper everyone up and get them okay again. And then I'd be leaving again. And yeah, so we yeah, had yeah. to go uh, purely online. We haven't had an office now for yeah, four or five years, half our teams in the Philippines. And I've never worked in a company with greater culture. Like my Filipinos, they understand the business, they get the brand. They're doing a lot of our content writing, a lot of our marketing awesome. and stuff like that. But it took us a long time to, 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 to first like nail the hiring process, but then also build a culture that see yeah. all of us as being equal team members, regardless of where they are. And, and that, honestly, they're the best employees I've got um, because they get the business, they know the business. But again, it comes back to, to vision, mission and values, which I talk first three chapters in here, like without vision, mission and values, you can't build that solid foundation to scale a team. But I do also agree though too, there is particular roles that are better hired uh, locally than, than outsourced. But you know, we've outsourced a lot of things we were told by people we could never outsource. And I think it just comes down to as well, like hiring the right people, having the right kind of onboarding. You know, it, right. Yeah, it's fine. That is the ultimate lesson, right? So the, our most successful offshoring for us outsourcing was when we actually put the diligence in to bring that person on board just as if they were here. Yeah. 
you know, to think that there's robots out there that are just going to nail it, eradicate was that's, our that's mistake. A, that's and that's, that's what we thought. Yeah. Like, oh, here's someone's going to do it for a few dollars an hour and they're going to be a machine. No, yeah. they're human beings. And, and they, they can do sales things. and marketing and data collection and they can be a PA. Like there's this, there's this perception that VAs can do like a hundred different jobs amazingly. And it's just, yeah. you wouldn't do that locally. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, question here from Tim. Question from Mike. Hopefully he's fine to share. Uh, how has Mike's financial and property investment strategy evolved over the years? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I, um, the first thing I did, so uh, let me just kind of rewind. Uh, 12 years ago, uh, when I hit rock bottom, I, I lost all my money. Um, I then accumulated debt. I, I had, I think, over $350,000 of debt. I think I had $75,000 of credit card debt. I actually have a document. I wrote it in Profit First. I remember listening to, on the radio, driving, and uh, the station came on and it said, the average American has $5,000 of credit card debt and saying, I want to be average. I want to be average. Like, I was overwhelmed with debt. Yeah. Um, it, it took me about, I think, six or seven years of doing the Profit First system to eradicate all debt. Today, I, I have no debt, no credit card. No, no debt. Actually, I take it back. I have one debt. I have a property I own that I have a mortgage on. Um, but I expect to eradicate that pretty quickly. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, I believe in investing in businesses. So I have equity in many small businesses now, not as an angel investor, but as a partner in those businesses with no downside risk. It's called a phantom stake where I get the upside, but not the downside risk. So that was very strategic from me because I realized here owning a business, uh, you own you win on the wins, you own the losses. Um, so you gotta be careful, but also to protect myself too. Um, and then property is interesting. I've just started to investigate owning property. So I don't own property outside my home and, and some personal stuff, but now I'm looking at doing investment properties and I'm, I'm probably gonna spend many years investigating. I already started interviewing people. I'm learning a lot about it. And I'm trying to learn from other people's mistakes so I don't repeat those. So that's, that's my strategy for now. Yeah. And could I just, just a shameless plug for you too, Mike, like if you guys are watching, you haven't yet read profit first, absolutely make sure that before you, you finish the interview, you either buy the audio or buy the book, like it's an absolute game changer when it comes to just completely simplifying the way that you manage finances and grow a very, very healthy and profitable business. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl from Sydney. Could Mike talk a bit about the profit first tagline, learn to stand out from the comp competition, dictate a premium price and serve your clients like never before? Yeah. So uh, let's, let's go through this step by step. So first of all, um, when, it talks, when we talk about the competition, what we have to realize is that in any industry, there becomes an industry standard. That is the greatest thing to avoid because that's the industry norm. Mm. And norm means it's being commoditized. So I work with a lot of accountants and bookkeepers. I have a, a business that we certify accountants and bookkeepers in the profit first methodology. We have uh, actually, we have an office in uh, Melbourne and I think we have now 40 uh, Australian certified members in the, in the US, whatever collective, we're approaching 500 now. Mm. And um, what we found is to the consumer, because the industry of accounting is so standardized, there's an industry standard that an accountant is a commodity. Yeah. So when, when an accountant approaches a client and says, yeah, I do accounting, like, oh, you're an accountant. I know what an accountant does. Are you cheaper? So once you're seen as a standard, a commodity, there's downward price pressure. The mm -hmm. only differentiator a customer can see is all accountants are the same. You better be cheaper. So the first lesson I, I want to share is the need to differentiate, to, to to, to not even use the label of your industry is the hack. So we tell our members, accountants and bookkeepers, you're not an account or bookkeeper, you're a profit advisor. Because when you position yourself that way and, and now a prospect says, what do you do? You say, I'm a profit advisor. They're like, oh, I've never heard that. Which means they can't put you in the categorized, categorized category of being standardized or commodity. Yep. Therefore you can dictate a higher price point. So that's actually the starting point is a clear differentiation. And it maybe is even the label of what you do to break from the industry. Yeah. Then in dictating a premium, what I found so interesting is one of the first determinants of your value is your price point. There was a, uh, in Robert Saldini's book, Influence, there's that story. I don't know if you, did you read that book, Barry. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I'm probably going to bastardize the story, but basically he said that um, there was like a cruise ship coming into uh, some island where uh, all the people get off the cruise ship and there was one of those jewelry stores that was selling, you know, the local uh, jewelry and people would buy it uh, as a memento. And there was this one product line of jewelry that just wasn't selling. So I'll, I'll do it on a piece of paper here. The, the store owner out of frustration uh, says, she writes one half like, like this. Uh, she writes one half for the price and telling the, the, the store owners who wants to sell the style manager, cut the prices in half. And the next, uh, you know, a few days later, the store owner comes back and all the jewelry has been sold out. And the store owner goes to the manager, like, oh, good job cutting the price in half. And the, the store manager says to the store owner, she, she gets red face and she goes, oh, you wanted me to cut the price in half? I thought that was a times two. I thought that was an X. I thought you wanted me to double the prices. Um, I double the prices. And the store owner's like, well, what the hell happened? Well, here's what Tildini was teaching us. The perception of value is first judged upon price. Because the jewelry was so inexpensive, people saw it as not significant. It was, it was cheap stuff. But when the price was doubled, this meant something. This was valuable jewelry. This is the stuff they wanted to remember their trip from. So it was actually the increasing in price that, that changed the value perception. Well, this is true not just for jewelry. It's true for anything. Your price immediately dictates, at least at a subconscious level, the value of your offering. So if you're the cheapest person on the block, your offering is cheap and customers will see it that way. If you're the most expensive, the customer may get shocked, but then they'll say, well, how can they justify such a price like that? The customer will actually start arguing why that's justifiable. They'll put you in the position to explain, here's our differentiation. We're not accountants, we're profit advisors. Yeah. So step two is you must have a price that's representative of something of significance, of value. Therefore, the, usually in most cases, most businesses are underpricing themselves. Increasing the price increases the perception of value and the customer is more vested in a successful outcome. Yeah. So if they're gonna spend more money, they want this to work out. It's usually the clients that pay you the least that are the big bitchers and moaners, you know? It's, it's the yeah. ones who pay the most that value you. So that, that was the essence of Profit First. And, and the last part is profit is not an event. Profit is a habit. Once you make these adjustments, we must be extracting profit from our business on a continual basis. I mean by this transaction. Today, if I had 20 transactions go through, I was profitable 20 times. I used to think that profit happened one time at the end of the year when my accountant said, hey, congratulations, you had a $15,000 profit. Well, and, and then the worst part is I'd be like, well, where's the money? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's an accounting profit. It's actually gone. No, I, I'm talking our definition of profit, cold, hard cash. I want cash in my bank available for me to do whatever I want with. And that has to be a habit. So write that one down. Profit is not an event, profit is a habit. We're gonna bake it into your business. Every transaction must be profitable. And it's these accumulation of small wins that bring about that big win. And I don't do it once a year, I do it every quarter. So today we're doing this live on the 20th. Just 21 days ago was the end of Q2. I had my profit distribution came out. I celebrated with it. I bought a pinball machine, by the way, um, <laughs> so I went home and I did other things too. And I put stuff to hurt savings, but it feels good. And I'm so excited that we're now 70 days away from my next profit distribution. Yeah. That's how profit should be treated. It's a reward to the shareholder, but it'll only happen if you make profit a habit and not an event. Yeah. What I, what I love the most about profit first, I'm not sure if this was like your intention when it was created, but it actually significantly shifts your psychological connection to wealth and value. So I've worked with a lot of people from a mindset perspective that have, you know, grown up with limiting beliefs when it comes to attracting wealth. And they've wondered why they've hit a certain threshold that they can't break through. I spoke at an episode the other day with Michelle Masters, who was one of my earlier like NLP and, and uh, change work practitioner teachers. And often that, that threshold would be around what their parents earned. And the interesting thing about mm. profit first is although you don't necessarily talk too much about the mindset and, and, and addressing limiting beliefs when it comes to making money, when we start to pay ourselves first, which I spoke about the richest man in Babylon uh, as well, when we start to pay yeah. ourselves first and put this money away, automatically we start to shift the value that we place on ourselves as well. We start to shop differently to deals. We say no more, you know, we say no more often to clients that we don't want to serve or that don't fit 
a kind of ideal client and it, and it completely shifts our whole perspective around wealth and wealth generation just through having a habit in place of paying ourselves first and putting profit aside. You know, profit first has been a great experiment in that regard. I, it is all rooted on behavioral psychology. That's a passion of mine. So I studied the behavioral implications, but really from execution, for example, there's a thing called the behavioral path. When, when we do something, it becomes habitual. We do it over and over again. To change habits is very hard, but to channel habits is very easy. So if I can keep doing the same thing, but get the right result, that's better. Um, that's why, and I'm not saying vaping is a good thing, but cigarettes replaced by vaping because it's the same pattern. Um, here, here's a better example. I, I've been trying to exercise my entire life, and I do, but it's haphazard. Except for starting five years ago, I don't miss a single workout. I haven't for five years. I, I feel I'm in the best shape of my life as a result. And what I did was I intercepted a behavioral path. Yeah. I used to wake up in the morning, go to the bathroom, say I work out, but I make a cup of coffee. I start reading the paper. And I'm like, I don't have time and I'll get to it tonight. And I'd never do it. I realized the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is go to the bathroom. Therefore, I put my sneakers, my gym shoes on top of my toilet seat. So the only way I can use the bathroom is by grabbing my gym shoes. Now I got my shoes in my hand. I got to put them on my feet. Now I'm on my feet. I need to walk down to the gym. And I've now channeled that, that habit to get the outcome yeah. I want. So that's what I did with Private First. There's certain things we do, like logging into our bank accounts and not reading the accounting system, which we actually want to continue to do, but channel toward profit. The grand experiment has been kind of stuff you shared, that people's perspective of wealth has changed. But the greatest discovery has been growth in businesses. And this is something I never expected, but we have well over 350,000. We think we're approaching now 400,000 businesses that have implemented Profit First. The great realization is this that businesses that do profit first grow faster than their competition, which makes no sense because we all know it takes money to make money. You need to plow back and reinvest. You need to spend on marketing. But here's what we found, and we have thousands of case studies to back. Here's what we found. Businesses that take their profit first. So say one company makes $1,000 uh, and just spends it. Another company makes $1,000, but they don't spend it. They take away $200 of profit and store it away. So they have $800. Now there's a company with $1,000 versus $800. The $800 company has less money to spend on advertising, for example. So they become more selective. They say, yeah. what is the stuff that was working? Let's spend the money in there. And the stuff that's not working, we're going to avoid that. We don't have the money for that anyway. Yeah. So they become more selective on how they market. They become more selective on the customers they work with. Those type of customers they're a pain in the ass to work with and we don't make so much money on them. We don't have money to spend or lose. We got to work with better customers. But the company with the excess money, the full thousand, they say, well, we can try multiple things. We have the money to do it. Oh, we can use all clients. We can serve all clients because we have the money to back even the bad clients. So the companies with more money take way more risk on and start compromising the business. The businesses that have less money to spend become more selective and they bet on the sure things and start growing faster. That was something I, I never really anticipated, but consistently across all industries, yeah. businesses that take their profit first grow faster than their contemporaries. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. So Mike, uh, for anyone watching, listening today, how can they best connect with you? Obviously jump on Amazon and buy any of your amazing books, but what's the best way they can kind of connect with you or uh, see what you're up to? Yeah, so the, the best way to directly connect with me is uh, go to my website, Here's the deal. It's Mike Michalowitz.com. And I know it. I can't, I can't spell that freaking name. Motorbike so there's a, shortcut. there's a shortcut. It's Mike Motorbike, as in the motorcycle. And uh, here's the deal. That was my nickname in high school. That was my G-rated name in high school. Uh, I got other nicknames too. But uh, you can go to MikeMotorbike.com. And on there, I have um, Profit First, plus all the other books I've written. You can get chapters. and You can start experimenting with it even before you purchase the book. Or if you don't, you don't even need to buy the book. Um, I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. I have my own podcast up there. You can check it all out at MikeMotorbike.com. Fantastic. We'll put the link below. Uh, connecting with Mike. Mike, one more question before we wrap things up. Uh, knowing what you know now and being through what you've been through, if you were to have a conversation with a 10-year-old version of you, what advice would you give him? I'd probably say it, it, it's all good. I, I don't know if I'd understand that, but like it's, it's all good. Like There's a pandemic going on. I've, and I'm sure you've had to like family or friends or people that you know of that have been affected or died from this. Um, you know, business is struggling and there's ups and downs, but at the end of the day, it's all been good. 
not that someone dies is a good thing, but the mm. fact that reflecting upon that person had an existence and a life that they experienced is the good thing. So instead of just looking at the negative, which I was very focused on, like, oh, why me? I suck. And why me? What is there something I can learn from? Or is there something I can value outside of this trauma or challenge? It's all been good. And I, listen, I don't wish any challenges upon businesses. I don't want to go through what I've experienced ever again. And I hope I never do. But if I do, I hope now I understand that it is necessary and ultimately helpful in the life journey of business and, and the human life. Yeah, I love that. Very, very wise advice. And uh, look, if you'd like to stay up to date with the latest of our li Freedom Life Street uh, series, also the launch of my book, The Path to Freedom, The Nine Steps to Create a Profitable Business That Can Work Without You, uh, we'll put a link below as well. Stay up to date and uh, look forward to bringing more amazing guests like Mike. Mike, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate all you've had to share with everyone. If you guys have liked it, hit the like button, uh, put your comments below and start a watch party so more people can see uh, Mike's message as well. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Barry. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Game Changers podcast. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd love you to do to help us and help yourself to spread the message further. Uh, make sure that you like the Game Changers on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, please subscribe by clicking the link below to ensure that you keep up to date with the weekly episodes we uh, share here at the Game Changers podcast with amazing entrepreneurs and business owners around the world. And of course, like if you're in a position where you may be overwhelmed with business or looking for a way to grow faster and more effectively, and you realize that the key to success is being surrounded by amazing people who have been there and done that before, I'd like to invite you to apply to have a game plan session one-on-one -on -one with one of my team here at The Game Changers. There's no cost. If you get through, uh, all that we ask is that you are doing a minimum of $250,000 per year to really be able to utilize the strategies and tactics and the mindset shifts that we share with you, uh, that you're coachable, that you're a decent person and you're, you know, you're willing to take on board some advice. If not, that's totally cool. Uh, but I know for me, I wouldn't be where I'm right now without the support of so many mentors and coaches and resources along the way. And I'd like to pay that forward and give back to you the opportunity to work with uh, us one-on-one -on -one for free to put together a customized game plan. And the reason we're doing this is a couple of things. Number one is that sometimes it's just the smallest thing that can make the biggest difference. And uh, I think that entrepreneurs and business owners have the opportunity to change the world. And if we can maybe help you to, to make the smallest shift to change your life and your world, uh, you're changing ours in return. The second thing is that we are always looking for amazing clients to work with and to welcome into and invite into the Game Changers community. And so if at the end of the call, you do feel that there's a huge amount of value there, uh, that we fit, feel that there's a great value fit there, we can have a conversation about working together. But uh, this game plan call, there's absolutely no obligations to work with whatsoever. Allow us to help you with uh, the years and years and years of, of knowledge that we have in growing and scaling great companies. Companies. And uh, I think that uh, business owners are the future of the world. If there's a way that we can help you to create a better business, more profit, more fulfillment, more fun, I would love the opportunity to do that now. So click the link below, book your game plan session, make sure you follow us on social and stay up to date with the latest episodes of the Game Changers podcast. My name's Barry William McGuddy. Thank you so much for your support and look forward to seeing the next one. Bye for now.